Thank you for joining us today for our conversation with Dr. Reed Tuxen. My name is Stephanie Friedhoff. I'm a professor of the practice here at the school and as somebody who works uh, in the health equity but also the information equity space, it is such a distinct pleasure today to open up this program for us and welcome our distinguished guest. Dr. Tuxen, as many of you know, is the former public health commissioner of DC. He's a longtime leader in the health innovation and health equity space, a fearless advocate for better health for all, and a trailblazing coalition builder who started the Black Coalition Against COVID and now a new initiative that you should all know about. That's called the Trust Rebuilding Trust for Health. Coalition in, for Trust Coalition in Health for and Trust Science. in Health and Science. My apologies. That's all right. <laughs> Right, but it is about how do we rebuild trust, and that's one of the things I am sure we will hear about today. Today's program is part of our Dean's Conversation series. It's also part of our um, Black History Month programming. And the format will be that Dean Ja will be in conversation with our guest. And you all have QR codes, or some of you have QR codes on your table. Uh, please pass them around if you want to ask a question. We will get to those at the end. I'll be organizing them a little bit and ask audience questions so that just so we can get in as many as possible. As many of you know, I could spend the entirety of our time together just talking about these two amazing people and their bios. You all know how to read, so please go online and learn more. <laughs> What's important for our conversation today is that both of these are doctors who chose the messy world of public health over, shall we say, a career in surgery or science, something that is less messy and probably also more lucrative. Both have th served in government positions facing some of the harsh realities of politics, competing needs and underfunded public health programming. And both share a deep commitment to serving people, not systems, and to not accept the status quo. So please help me in welcoming the two for what I know will be a timely and important, but also really frank conversation about where we're at with health and health equity. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, really is just a huge honor for me to spend the next hour or so with Reed Tuxen, uh, somebody who's been a hero of mine for a very long time. Uh, and you will very quickly, beyond his incredibly impressive CV, you will very quickly come to realize why. Um, Reed, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I want to start um, by asking you to go back um, quite a ways to your training Georgetown Med School, you're at HOP, Hospital University of Pennsylvania as an internal medicine resident, uh, early 80s. The best and brightest, you were one of the best and brightest, all went into cardiology or oncology or gastroenterology, never infectious disease, and certainly not primary care, internal medicine. And they also went into the lab and worked out the mechanism of the how the adenosine receptor interacts with the platelet. To, and you chose a different path. And you went down a very different way to have impact in the world. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that time period. Um, what made you go down this different path? Um, what pressures you feel like people faced at the time to, to do the more traditional and um, just a little bit about that time period and, and kind of what followed next. Thank you very much. And again, it's just a pleasure. Um, the, the, the answer to that uh, starts with, um, I'm a little kid, um, about uh, four years old, just newly cognizant <laughs> in the world. And I'm watching my, my mother put on the visiting nurse's uniform, um, grabbing a big black bag and getting in the visiting nurse's car to go attend to people uh, in the poorest part of Washington, D.C., um, uh, you know, knowing that she was going to be walking down alleys to get to the place that she needs to get to, um, and all the guys playing crap, stopping the crap game to, because that's the nurse. 
and she's on her way there. And, and, and what I'm getting at is this sense of, of, of being aware in the back of my head that she was doing something very important um, and in very unusual environments. Um, so that sort of was, was, was sort of a big part of it. Um, fast forward into being an adult, I was lucky enough uh, uh, to be able to be in the lab. I spent a year in the lab and I loved it and I enjoyed it. I, I had a chance to, uh, I, I got to spend a time in, when I was in medical school with the best cardiologist, one of the best iconic cardiologists in the country, a guy named Proctor Harvey at Georgetown. And I, I hung with Proctor. I mean, I got to be around him. And, and, and I really had a chance to be influenced by that and, and the level of expertise of, of just really competence at what we do. Um, but also one where Dr. Harvey was a, a fanatic for laying on of hands, for touching a person. Uh, he, he almost was, had an, uh, a derision for uh, the, the, the fellows that were technolo technologists. And he would say, I know what the, what's going on just by put, putting my hand on the carotid pulse and, and feeling these things. And so it was that sense of, of aliveness. And so I got all of those things and felt good. And so when I got to the University of Pennsylvania at HUP, I was headed to be this cardiologist. And, and, and I had and done this year of cardiovascular pharmacology research. And it was just so exciting. But I also, so I had the chance that we were at, at HUP, we also we were responsible for caring for the VA. And so on a Saturday, I, went, I was the admitting officer, junior resident at the VA, and diagnosed five people in end-stage heart disease. And all of a sudden, all the excitement of what I had been trained to do just seemed a little suboptimal because these people were going to die um, from preventable illness. And, and I came back across to HUP and ran into a guy that was, became an icon in the profession who was running the general medicine program, a man named uh, 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 John Eisenberg. And, 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 and I said to John, I asked him, John, why is it that all of these people are dying from essentially preventable disease? And he looked at me and his eyes got big and he said, you're one of us. <laughs> well, you need to change programs. You need to get out of that and come over here. Well, the good thing, and that's what you are doing here, Ashish, which I think is so important, but the good thing is, is that in that one of us-ness, was a very high level of, of expertise, of a commitment to academic principles, to, to an extraordinary sense of we are going to be very good at this primary care, this, this integration, this relationship between the clinical environment and the social realities. Of, we're going to be very good at this. This is not something where, although the, 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 the patina of the academy there was, you know, white coat, stethoscope dripping out of your pocket, I'm the cardiology fellow, and the rest of you all are dumb nuts, you know? And it, you know. But, but John, through the force of his personality and his intellect, elevated that general medicine fellowship to another level. And so I was lucky enough then to, that was the, the opening door, was to then say, okay, you can come in here and start looking at healthcare not only from your expertise, but how do you change? And then uh, to, answer, to finish my answer, um, I was lucky enough to be, uh, uh, they put me in the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars world, where at that time in history, it was the beginning of the movement to train clinicians with non-clinical skills to be able to change the world. They were very clear, we are here to change the world. And we want to train people like you uh, with augmentative skills. So I went to the Wharton School of Business. I, I ran, uh, I did a bunch of other things, which maybe we can get into, but I did a lot of other things on top of my clinical skills. And I think it was through that that I then sort of got launched down this, this road. And it's an interesting, um, it was an interesting intellectual shift, right? Because until then, the assumption was, if you're a great cardiologist, you're a great oncologist, that you can run things. You can be the health system leader that you don't need all this other stuff and you don't need training in evidence-based medicine. What do you think caused that shift and for, for leaders like John Eisenberg who really defined a field that I got to benefit from uh, a decade, decade and a half later, that this idea of augmenting the, the basic skills, 
where do you think that came from and how effective do you think that has been? I think it arose uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is the research and the, 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 the knowledge we got from people like Mike McGinnis and, and these people. For those of you that don't Mike, Mike is still the head of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, of a half of the portfolio of the National Academy of Medicine. But Mike is the one that really put forward in a way that was compelling to a lot of us on the real causes and treatment of illness, not being a, the traditional biomedical uh, uh, the narrow box, but but looking at all of the social environments, the lifestyle issues, all of those as being etiological, much more important than the narrow therapeutic window of our of our tools. And so I think that that was a big uh, change. And and his work made sense. It just it just was it, it made it opened our eyes to go, oh yeah, that that it's un, it's it's an, an unimpeachable thesis that has whose consequences have far ranging. I mean, it, it calls the question. If you, you know, look at your ed letter you wrote to, to medical school, you know, and then you look at the, the larger purposes that are articulated so wonderfully in those paragraphs, and now all of a sudden somebody's telling you that your work fits into a broader context. And the question is, is were you really serious when you said that you were passionate about your mom going into the poorest parts of the town to save people's lives? And to, and to, so, so that's the. But the second, very tangible uh, reason I think, uh, Aisha, is that healthcare was becoming too complex and too costly, mm -hmm. and that there. And, and you won't, you know, it's amazing how long we have been saying that we cannot sustain the trend. By the way, you cannot. It is over. You cannot. <laughs> if you ever want to know, the sky is falling. It is. Games, it's, it's now finally, after years of saying it, it is now true. There ain't no more money. We'll do it another day. But anyway, so my point was that, um, was that as people who are paying the bills started to realize that we cannot continue like this, as we started having people who are running institutions coming up across the really complicated uh, economics of healthcare. The economics of healthcare really started emerging very rapidly right at that point. And it was then that people started getting at, uh oh. So, that th the best lesson I, and just to make it concrete as I close out the answer, is that I remember um, we would order uh, a panel of thyroid tests, just like that. We think that there's thyroid issues. Order all the stuff. Didn't matter because money wasn't a problem. We just order whatever you wanted, and then you get the answer back. And it was John Eisenberg and them that would say, uh, excuse me, uh, why don't you order a, the test <laughs> that you need to make the diagnosis? That you need to be much more specific about what you are doing because you are spending somebody's money, and you need to be a much better steward of that. So I think it was the collision of both of those together. Yeah, and what John and his and people around him did was brought rigor to that that conversation. Okay, so um, I want to talk about two more um, kind of phases of, of your career and, and your reflections, and then I want to get to some more contemporary issues. So you finish training, and not that far after that, you find yourself back home in Washington, D.C. Um, but you told a story to the students this morning about the struggle around that decision Department of Health of D.C. versus a different opportunity. Um, do you mind sharing that story well, with, with folks? W what else was on the possibility list, <laughs> right. and why did you end up where you ended up? So I'm, I'm, I'm having a wonderful time as a Robert Johnson Clinical Scholar. I'm in a fellowship program. I'm, I'm, I've got a preventive medicine radio show every week on the jazz station. I've got, um, I'm reaching out and doing, uh, I'm the medical director of a skilled nursing home because I was interested in geri geriatric issues. I'm, I'm seeing patients in the clinic. I'm the student health service doc because I needed money because I had two kids. You know, I'm like taking every odd job you can get. Um, I'm at Wharton sort of playing around there and I'm doing all this stuff. Just having a wonderful, intense time. And then I get a phone call from the docs in D.C. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much, D.C. was a, as a community where as we grew up, um, until John F. Kennedy, our community couldn't vote for president. And we did not, we did not have any home rule. We were ruled by a three-person congressional Southern Congress people ruled us. And so our family, uh, my parents were very much the sense that 
if we ever get a chance <laughs> to run our own affairs, you know, we're really going to show them that we didn't need to be treated in a colonial environment. Um, and, and basically, every night at the dinner table, I did, without my knowing it, I'm being like implanted along with the spinach, you know, a, a, a sense that you will, you will meet these expectations, young man, or else. And, uh, when it, and, and, and so you better be ready. So I'm now at, at, at Penn, I'm doing all this, and then I get a phone call from the black docs in DC going, we have trouble in the health department, we're very unhappy with where it's going, you must come home now and serve. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, how do I go to my residency and fellowship director and all these people saying I'm going to leave a year and a half in and not finish? But I was lucky enough that they were the kind of people who said the whole point of you being here was to go back home. <laughs> go with our blessing. You've got enough from us. We've given you everything we need to go. And so you, you, need, to, uh, you, need, you need to go back. And so it was that sense for me of, of going back into that environment was we have the opportunity to, to, to show a result, to show that we can, we can do it. And I also needed to, 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 to give that service back. But again, I come back to, you can't watch, I can't watch my mom uh, do that and then say, well, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm too busy right now. I'm in a convenient uh, place. And um, uh, now the, the, the worst part of going back was an enormous culture shock because I go in as a special assistant to the health commissioner and I get in there and there's no journal club like John Eisenberg had. There's no, you know, I'm like, I'm going from a rocket ship going 100 miles an hour to basically a backwater political hack kind of environment. I got so angry, frustrated. After four months, I quit. I couldn't do it. I just simply could not do it. And I was very fortunate that I get a call from the mayor's office, and they said, we heard about you. There's a, you know, we heard there was a new young gun in town. Um, don't quit. Please don't. Uh, tell you what, why don't you, you you've, you've got a lot of experience, but you don't really know how to do anything. You're still a wet behind the ears whippersnapper, no matter what you think you are. Um, and so why don't you take on, learn how to do something by taking on the hardest job in the Department of Human Services? We, we're, we want you to run the Mental Retardation Developmental Disabilities Administration, which is in social services, not in public health. And they don't like doctors because they ain't sick. <laughs> so you have to put your MD in your pocket, go over to social service, and we want you to outplace from the warehouse for the mentally ill and developmentally disabled into community-based group homes. Property value local politics and we're going to have you run that. And, and, and you have to make these decisions with your life. And I said, I'll do it. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and that led down a whole other road, but the only thing I'll end with here is what it taught me the most. In all the things I thought I believed, it taught me what it means to be a human being. It taught me the dimensions of a human being. It taught me a certain level of empathy and compassion and the last thing it taught me is this, and nobody understands this, and any of you that have to, looking for a little project to do, I'll give you a, a, a clue. Look at the homeless people on the city streets. In any city you look at, you do not see the mentally retarded, developmentally disabled. And the reason is because when those folks were outplaced from these institutions, they had to have a comprehensive care plan, a comprehensive assessment every year of their psychological, physical, dental, re speech and hearing, occupational therapy, all of it, and all of it managed by case managers. And it was every year, and it was reviewed by the courts. And that's the reason, and so that infrastructure, and all of a sudden now we come to this place where we're talking about comprehensive care management and, 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 you know, and all that stuff. All of those models were, taught, were created ultimately in the MRDDA world, and nobody knows about it. So if you want a little project, go back and look and see that and how it's manifested and see whether or not it's still true. But I have not seen the MRDDA people on the streets as homeless, whereas the mentally ill, a whole nother story, and they did not have that system. There's a lesson in there somewhere. A lesson of how systems can make an enormous difference in, in people's lives. Um, you were also the president of one of the only four uh, historically black medical schools. Um, in LA, 
I was going to ask you about that experience. I'm actually going to ask you a slightly different question. If we go back 40 years and look at the proportion of physicians who were African American men, if we look at that number today, it hasn't changed. No. No. We have made, look, we have a long way to go, but we have made a lot of progress on a lot of issues. But the fact that the proportion of physicians who were black men in 1970, 1980, 1990, essentially the same as 2024, strikes me as both deeply problematic and a bit confusing, because we are making progress in other areas. Having run a medical school, having thought about these issues, and again, we've seen it, a real increase among African American women, and that uh, is, is good progress. Again, we gotta do better. Is, why do you think that number has been flat for so long? I think mainly because black men continue to struggle so greatly for purchase in our society. Our sense of, our, of who we are and what we are has been so beat on so long, so hard. Uh, our ability to have access to the kinds of school, even though black women are doing much better in the same schools, but still, the, if you just take the, 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 the challenge already at, at, the, at, the, at the early stages is so great for both black men and women. But, the, but black women seem to, 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 for some, and for reasons that people do not understand how they've been able to overcome that, but black men have been so distracted by so many needs to be so many other things uh, than being prepared for that solitary discipline necessary to, uh, to master complex curricula. Uh, that solitary focused discipline is much more difficult for us. And the areas that we focus on are obvious, are, are obvious and, and, and we see it in the sports and then we see it in entertainment. Uh, those are more, more, more accessible to us for whatever reason. But that sitting down quietly day after day mastering this stuff uh, is, is uh, has been, been very, very difficult for us. Um, and it still is. And um, we've got to start changing that perception. We've got to continue to remind uh, our, our folk of what we are capable of doing. And, and that, the, 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 the possibilities of a meaningful future. You know, it's like, if I think about the way to answer it also is this, and I appreciate the question, I hadn't thought about it in a while, is if we try to say to a black man, don't be sexually active until you are involved in a mutually, I was a health commissioner in DC doing between 85 and 90, the height of the AIDS epidemic. We had to, I mean, that was, that was where I cut my teeth when I finally became commissioner of health. Uh, that, was, that was my thing, in addition to the crack cocaine epidemic, the angel dust, <laughs> I mean, you know, the heroin overdose, you know, the over, but it was still AIDS. And we would try to say, don't be involved in a, in a, in a, a relationship outside of a mutually monogamous relationship uh, unless you wear a condom and you must do all these things. And, and we would talk about that. And the, and the answer back would be, doctor, do you understand what it, takes to be a child, a human child. You need to be held, embraced, and nurtured. You need to be loved. Every time I walk across the street, the woman that I see will walk across on the other side and grab her pocketbook closer to her. The only time I'm on television is when my, is when my blood is flowing red down the city's concrete or my hand is tied behind my back. The only person who actually ever says anything good to me is when she says, oh, Johnny, you are powerful. Oh, you are magnificent. When are you coming back, brother? That's my sense of me. Don't smoke cigarettes until you, because when you get cancer when you're 45 and heart disease when you're 50. Doctor, the leading cause of death in my community is homicide. I'm not gonna live past 30. You're talking about cancer when I'm 50? What are you gonna give me in trade, man? What do you got for me? What is your answer? This four color brochure doesn't mean anything. So what I'm getting at is, too many of us have got caught up in that perception of the world. And where we then exhibit ourselves is how beautiful we are, how strong we are, how masculine we are, how manly we are, but not defining ourselves as how intellectual we are. And I think that we're fighting a lot of that 
legacy uh, at, at this very moment. And you, thank you for that answer. And it, it leads me to something you've said before, which is the idea of hopelessness and despair as social determinants of health. We tend to think of social determinants as housing and access to food and, um, but you've, on multiple occasions, suggested we need to expand that list a little bit to include issues of despair, include issues of hopelessness. Um, how do we, both from a public health, particularly from a public health point of view, begin to address those issues. If we do see them, like look, if you said to me, housing is a social determinant of health, I'll be like, absolutely. We need to have more affordable housing and here are five policy ideas and we can debate those ideas, but there's a path forward to deal with that. Yes. What's uh, the path forward to deal with hopelessness and despair? Well, one of the things that we, you and I, I think agree on a lot is that by asking these questions and responding to these questions, we take a very realistic point of view. Um, that, in other words, if you think I'm going to give you an easy answer, you're nuts. <laughs> you know, because that would be intellectually insulting. It is very hard uh, to do that. But let's look at places where it exhibits. You know, genius is not confined to any box. It's, 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 it's always there. It just has to be untapped. It is very hard for me to accept the, the rap artists in many ways. So much of what they do or say is problematic for me. Uh, the, the giant gold chains, you know, with a, or the giant gold cross, you know, it's like, I don't think that Jesus really had that in mind, you know. <laughs> you know, a $500,000 gold cross just seems a little bit off track. But what I am learning from listening to these people these are very bright, very bright people. They are not only literate and articulate, but they are smart business people. Their engagement with the world is far beyond any engagement I will have. Because one of them has a, I wish I could remember the lyrics in the song, but basically he says, you know, I have been around the world. I have been on, you know, in the Paris runways. I know lawyers. <laughs> I know lawyers. I know business. You know what I mean? They know stuff. They are negotiating very complex uh, thing. Then in Atlanta, where I live now, it has been fascinating to see that these rap artists are like tugboats pulling a thousand other boats behind them. It's the hairstylist, the entertainment lawyer, it's the beats people. It, in other words, there is a whole industry of people who know how to make money together, who are brilliant. And then you take the unfortunate examples, but still true, of a Jay-Z, of a, of, a, of a 50 Cent. These guys were selling drugs on the corner a minute ago, and now they're running major corporations. So I think what I'm getting at is that as, 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 as we don't tend to think of them that way, but We've, and so we've never, as a public health community, actually co-opted them into our game. We see them as, I wish you didn't have those curse words, and I mean you shouldn't call women bees. Well, you shouldn't have curse words, you shouldn't call women bees. But at the end of the day, the difference between that as a risk versus you know, dying because we can't reach people like we need to reach them, uh, is, I'm, I'm prepared to go ahead and accept the bees for the, for the, for the survival. So what I'm getting at is that there is a genius in this community. And what we've got to do is to find ways, which we still have not been able to successfully do, is, is, that, is to be able to have the science lab available to that genius mind just at the moment when they could do the, the rap. It's like that, that fracture point was like, oh, I could do this or I could do that. It, but, but, but the tools... You know, I used to, and I'm sorry to make a long way to answer. I, 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 you know, it's like, and when, when graffiti first came out, I would be so sad to see all this stuff. You know, it just looked ugly and it nasty. Until you realize it doesn't take any resources to do that. You can express yourself very clearly for no money. On the rap stuff, it doesn't take 
a lot of technology. They use technology now, but you could create an art form that was not dependent. So the question for me now becomes, can you get available assets that people can reconfigure and engage at that break point intellectually? And I think that's really where it's going to come from. All right, so I'm going to fast forward because I want to get to questions from the audience. Um, to the pandemic. And where a little further into the pandemic, you and I had a chance to uh, spend some time together when I was uh, at the White House. But before that time, Easter Sunday 2020. Can you talk about Easter Sunday 2020? What got started? Why'd you start it? And how'd you do it? Um, right uh, as the very earliest stages of the pandemic started to become clear, I had to confront one of the good things about my life is I get to give commencement. Actually, I gave commencement here at Brown years ago. I can't remember when, but I did. Um, cold day, I remember that. <laughs> I remember going to the airport with my robe on. Literally, I felt like I was, old, I was like an English professor at like 1812. I mean, I looked like goodbye Mr. Chips running across the face. But anyway, um, I had to, because I, I give commencement a lot, I have to say the Hippocratic Oath a lot. And, and I get in touch with that oath. And, and so here's this crisis. People are dying like crazy. The docs are dying like crazy, the nurses. And I had to confront my ethics. What am I going to do? And so I volunteered, even though I wasn't in clinical practice, to, uh, when the, everybody else falls over, bring in the third string, that's me. And, you know, and so I signed up. And my wife and my kids and my grandkids went ballistic. Are you out of your mind? Do you know how old you are? You know, you can't do that. So I had to think about what would I do. So Easter Sunday 2020, the, the, the data was just sitting there in front of me about what this was going to be and what it was going to mean. And I could easily tell what it's going to mean for the black community. And having had been the commissioner of health during the AIDS epidemic, the height of it, I really understood. And so I said, look, I wish I had had as a health commissioner the community infrastructure organized uh, to be able to be top down, bottom up, bottom up, top down, and we have this crescendo. I wish I had had it. So I said, well, why don't I create it? And I said, I know a lot. I was living in Atlanta, but you couldn't go nowhere, so the Zoom was fine. And so I just started calling all of the influencers that, were, that I worked with all those years in D.C. So you call up the faith-based leaders, you call up the community-based health organization leaders, you call up the musicians and the poets, the artists, you know, the visual artists. Uh, you call up the returning incarcerated citizens advocate. You know, you call up all, you know, you, you know the small business owners. Uh, you just, and then the academics, uh, the Howard people. You know, you sort of call all these folks and say, we're going to create this thing. And we've got to, to move it and we've got to learn it. And, and that's what we did. With no money, no staff, no nothing, no permission, no bureaucracy, just we are now this thing. And we're going to meet every Monday and every Thursday, all of us together, and we're going to figure this thing out, and we're going to see each capacity who can do what. So who knows, the, 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 in D.C., it's not rap as much as it was the go-go musicians, you know, but it was, it was great stuff. You know. <laughs> um, uh, who knows the best go-go person? So we called up the go-go guy and say, hey, man, we need people to start wearing masks. It's really important, and we need you know, to do it. Can you, I, I'm going to send, uh, we're going to send a car and take you to a photographer who's going to photograph you wearing a mask. Uh, and it's going to be very nice. And then we call the bus station, the subway station, and say, look, you guys got a problem. Because all these people are going to be getting on your conveyances and putting your staff, your ticket counter, and the bus driver, and the subway train operator, all of them are going to be at terrible risk. So it's in your interest to let us take this photograph of the go-go guy with the mask on, on the sides of the buses and everywhere in the train thing, saying, I'm wearing mine, you wear yours. And, they, and, they, and, they, and immediately we got it through. No charge, no nothing. And they printed up the posters. And you got those, you know, we had the, um, you, you call up the, uh, you, you do, a, a, you do a, 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 a cell phone video contest, only on your cell phone, a minute. And I'll, out of my pocket, you write a check for the winner gets $1,000, $500 for the second and the third prize. And you have a national citywide competition 
on cell phone videos to tell people about wearing masks and social. And it was one by a, a, a sixth grader who did the best thing ever. And the mayor asked her to come and present it at a press conference. But you know, all of a sudden, you blanket the city with all these stupid, crazy things, none of which you have time for a grant. But for $1,000, you know, you just do it. So we, we, we did that. Then finally, very quickly, um, you, we could be easily see that we were going to be confronted with the need for a vaccine. And we knew that was going to be the deal, which meant you had to have vaccine clinical trials. So there we really needed, we couldn't just do this as a local community. We had to really get involved. So we called up the president of, the, of Howard University, the president of Meharry College of Medicine, the president of Morehouse, and the president of Charles Drew University. And all four of them say, you, are, you, I, I must, you must now be a part of the Black Coalition Against COVID, and I want to have unfettered access to your expertise. Then brought in the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association, the Urban League, and then the largest digital publisher for health information for the black community, and still is, blackdoctor.org. And all of that became the Black Coalition Against COVID nationally. And together, we mounted um, more than 30 uh, town halls uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, and one night, uh, we, we, one of the most best ideas, and I'll end with this, is one of the best ideas we had was, of course, connecting with all the black fraternities and sororities and social organizations and Jack and Jill and 100 black men and 100 black women and the NAACP and all those folks. And we had, a, had the government people, experts to be you know, expert presenters along with other black scientists. And then all of these organizations were sponsors which meant that they disseminated it throughout their entire network. That night we had an 800,000 reach. And so that really taught us, again, so the, the, the summary is that what we learned is with almost no money, with no bureaucracy and no infrastructure, you can just do it. Don't wait for permission, just get it done. And if you do it, ultimately it will happen. I will say that we benefited greatly from you, being there, um, and it is very important that, that, that people that do this kind of work have that kind of leadership at the top. Well, I was going to say, you didn't need money, you didn't need bureaucracy, but you did need vision and leadership, and that did not come out of nowhere. So thank you for, um, for, for making it happen. And I, I, I just wanted to stay on the issue of the Black Coalition Against COVID. So um, when I was at the White House, we certainly... Um, engaged and, and work together. Um, there is a real success story around vaccines and the black community. And that success story, again, didn't happen randomly. Um, can you go one level further down on how it is that we got to equal numbers or even slightly higher numbers of Black Americans getting the primary series yeah. compared to whites. That that is that was not expected. That was not predicted. That's not where I would have thought we would have landed because our history is not a glorious history of of getting to those things. And yet, that's where we got to. How did that happen? I think in in in, in several factors that that coalesced. Number one was that because the pandemic was so unequivocally there as opposed to diabetes, which is there, but it's, you know, it's there and it's always there and, and hypertension is always there and sickle cell is always there. The pandemic was in your face and we're gonna die. And it was a sense that we're gonna die more than other people are gonna die. So that it was, you're able to sort of use that in a way that says, this is a fight for black survival. It is also not unnoticed that it comes around the time when black folks are being particularly killed in all kinds of crazy places by the police and other things. So you've got the Black Lives Matter thing and all that going. And so it's very easy then to be able to pivot and say, well, if black lives matter, they have to matter to us first. So whether we live or die is on the table here. So there was a galvanizing, what is that thing that they say, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, so it was there for us, and, and we turned it into a, literally a sense that this, we have to survive. And we have to, and it was so clear that we were dying so much more than, than the rest of the nation that it, it, it galvanized you. Secondly, uh, I think that, that, that what it did was it also, we could take advantage of 
community infrastructures. Now, I'm going to be very clear here. The black community, like any community, is very much polarized itself. You know, there is the, the, the social organizations that I mentioned, and then the people that have never, they're not part of church, not part of nothing, not part of, never, didn't go to college, and they're, they're a whole other place. I'll come back, that's a different, it, you know. But for the rest of that infrastructure that I mentioned, it is organized. You can get at it if you can bring them in. And so learning the politics of black organizations was for me an art firm, because I wasn't a, 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 a fraternity person. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't one of those kind of, I was too radical, actually. I was just, anyway, um, so, um, <laughs> um, but that they have a very rigid hierarchy about how they behave, which could be frustrating at times, but what is also good is that they get stuff done because they're rigid and structured, so that they, there's a capacity to reach. So I think that's a big part of, 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 of what happened. So at the end of the day, we did, um, uh, and, then, and then because we were able to marry black physicians with the pastor. So we were in churches with the pastor there and the physician here, both speaking, but not as the pastor interviewing only the doc, the pastor having something to say himself or herself at the same time. So you're having both sides of the dynamic speaking together. So you have all this sort of going on. Then I think, um, so, so the, the, the bottom line is that um, we were able, amazingly, oh, and then you have to, we had to deal with the distractions. The, 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 the US Public Health Services study on Tuskegee. That kind of thing. We, had to, we went after those things head on. And I won't go into the techniques of how we did it, but we were benefited from meeting the descendants and having the descendants saying to the community, we're all vaccinated. And to have them pissed off at anybody that would use their family's legacy to vomit death. And in fact, what they said, and we, we were able to articulate this everywhere, <coughs> how dare you protest Tuskegee which was based on denying people access to the drug that would save their life by voluntarily denying yourself access to the drug that would save your life. It makes no sense. So we, you know, attack. So at the end of the day, what, 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 what Ashish is saying, and I think it's so powerful, for the first time in history, we did close a disparities gap, and we did it in record time. Now, I am pleased to win a race, but I hate winning a race when the other guy trips. And the reason that our community got the same vaccination numbers it, it, after the, you know, the first year as the white community is because white politicians killed their own people. Let's be very clear. They killed their own people. Now, I say that because of the following last point. What most people do not realize is that because of the closure of that gap in primary series vaccination and all the work that had been done on masks, and social distancing and being responsible because we had, had so many people who are older and we had all those chronic illnesses and there was a morality that says you shouldn't kill grandma. Because of all of those things, black life expectancy the second year was better than white America. Most people don't realize that. Yeah. That's the next step. So th th this had enormous mm -hmm. impact. And again, we did, we did okay. I'll end it with, uh, as, as I said, <coughs> we still have a lot of work to do for that group of people that we can't reach as easily. We try, we're doing a lot of great things with the barbershops and the beauty salons, which is a key focus, but there are real challenges still getting into that rap world and getting into these athletes. These athletes who, who are the most irresponsible people imaginable, so many of them, because they, tennis shoe sales are too, subtle at risk to be involved with anything that is controversial in the society. And so these, you know, they all love Muhammad Ali. Every one of them says, oh, we love Ali. Not one of them is willing to sacrifice dollars for the sake of higher moral principles. None of them. Well, very few of them. Uh, and the ones that we had to get ultimately were the retirees. The NFL Players Alumni Association were wonderful not the NFL players. Um, we're going to open up to questions. 
And uh, I think the way to do this is people have been sending in, hopefully, questions to Stephanie. So I'm going to hand over the mic to you to ask a question. And you get to help me answer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, I, I got to tell you all that, again, leadership means a lot. So I did not know him. I know who he was. I knew his level of expertise. But when he got in that position at the White House and we were in trouble, you know, or you needed some, you could call him. And that changes things. So I just want you to appreciate that if you have any aspirations to aspire to leadership, uh, don't shy from that. And please learn leadership from your dean. Uh, it will do you well, and it'll do the rest of us a great deal of good. Let's start with a leadership question then. Um, it's been fantastic to hear you uh, speak with so much nuance. Um, when talking about the early days of the Black Coalition against COVID, you said that sometimes you don't have time to wait for brand making, you just have to do it, and that, that leadership is really important. This is a big barrier, funding uh, often, structures often don't meet the needs of the field, but what have you learned about when to get creative and when to try to fix the bigger picture? Well, first of all, I really love that, that you just said the word nuance, uh, because I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of what I'm saying to you is frustrating to you because I can't give you blacks and whites, this or that, everything in this business. You use it in the introduction, messy world. All of our stuff, if you're not comfortable with messy, you know, go, go, go play numbers games or something somewhere. This is not neat, so, but, but um, the first thing, the answer to that is, and I'll, I'll make these answers shorter. Um, I'm very unhappy with the CDC. I am sick and tired of the black community, community-based and faith-based organizations getting episodic disease of the week funding and crisis lurching from crisis lurching without ever building a sustainable infrastructure. And there's nothing more demeaning than to have to go, and I, and I have a, I'm a, I apologize to, that I have a big, big ego. I do. <laughs> I, I, th I, I think of myself as, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. And nothing pisses me off more than to, to play in an Oliver play. Please, sir, I want some more. <laughs> and having to say it to somebody who's like eight years old, <laughs> who doesn't have the same passion or any, or any real world, it just irritates the hell out of me to have to beg for dollars. And the way in which it works, and I'll just be frank with you about it, you get these big white companies, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make this a fraction. I don't want to fractionate. I don't. I just, I just have to be, tell you what it is. You get these big white companies that get the big grants, and then they get all the indirect costs, and then they dole out subcontracts. And then you are lucky enough if you can hang on to the subcontractor of the subcontractor to get some, some money to do what you do. And when you get the subcontractor, subcontractor thing, you are in a box that says you can only do this and nothing else. And if you go outside of the box, you're going to get paid. And I, that happened to me so much. It happened to me one time, and I won't get into details. I had to call the big guy and say, look, y'all got to get involved in this and tell these subcontractors to go to hell and that we have the freedom to do what we want to do. So, so the main answer to your question is instead of how do you get at it, there needs to be a thoughtful restructuring of creating a viable, consistent uh, 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 infrastructure within community bases, within communities, with community face based organizations, so that instead of this one little plant after 15 years of episodic disease of the week funding, one little plant is there, no oasis and no garden. We need to figure out a way five years from now to look back and actually see a garden. In terms of the rest of it, in terms of just getting it done, in terms of the uh, question, I think, which I probably lost the thread of it, but, but, but I think that money is, you can, you can raise money in a lot of, a lot of different ways, uh, but just don't, just, you know, money is not just money, money is bartering. Bartering is, is a good move. Um, just begging is a good move. Um, just asking is a good move. Like the metro system. I couldn't afford to put those things on the metro, but I could call them up. I didn't know. They could, all they could do is tell me to go to hell. You know? So you just keep plugging away at every, the radio stations. You, know, for the, you just plug. You just, look, I, I, and by the way, I will bring you a camera ready. 
radio spot, you know? By the way, radio is much better than TV. Um, much better. Um, I, I'll give you a soup to nuts radio spot, all done professionally. All you gotta do is plug it in. That's all. Don't worry. So I think you just have to keep at it. But, 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 but whatever you do, and, if, and then the final thing would be is shame. Shame them. <laughs> it's like, look, we did this. You wouldn't even lift a finger and look what we've done. Now, don't you want to help out? I mean, really? Are you just going to leave us hanging? By the way, you know, this is only about, like, life and death. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and look, it was super effective. You were super effective. This coalition was super effective. But the truth is that if we're going to work on these issues for the long run, outside of crises, it is going to require sustained programmatic funding because funding means you can hire people for the long run. You can sustain expertise. You're not letting people go, hiring when you get a grant, letting people, it's just a terrible system. And you know, we all know about the Beltway Bandits, the small number of companies that get all the co government contracts. It's a serious problem and one that is going to require a very it different does. approach. But also, I, I just, but it also opens up this other thing, and I don't know what the culture is here inside of this academy. Uh, let me be very, 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 very specific and not nuanced. You got to be tight. No, you, you, does that translate over from the black community? You got to be. You got to know your stuff. You got to be tight. I mean, tight. And to the young people that we were talking to earlier, whatever you do, please don't think you know what you're going to do. <laughs> I don't have to pay attention to this course because I'm going to be doing it. No. You got to see it all. And you got to see what's what, because there's certain principles that are in a place that you didn't think you needed to be at that are going to be, oh, wait a minute. If I steal this methodology from this and apply it to this, that's genius. And all of you are geniuses. So you're looking for, for those. But what I'm getting to is, please don't let the, 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 the tyranny of the cardiologist with the stethoscope dripping out of your pocket overrule you. You have to also be tight on how to get stuff done. There's no point in having the expertise if you cannot translate that into service to and discourse with society. If you cannot translate your expertise into service to and discourse with society, what's the point? So I hope that you do not have the tyranny here of folks who say, well, that's soft. That's soft science. Uh, that's not what we do here. You know what I mean? It's like somehow we look down our nose at people. So if you want to get the grant, you have to be able to say, as you did for the long run, we have created an infrastructure here that is cost effective. Did I say the right word? cost effective. I mean, we're not going to just piss away your money on, on, because we don't know how to handle it. This is a serious enterprise. We are people that know what to do. We are people that know how to do it. And we know how to do it effectively and efficiently. We are willing to be transparent. And we're willing to report our results. And we're then finally willing, because we come from the academy, to look at this as a learning laboratory. That we will constantly get better every single time, and we will show you that we, d so I'm, I spent a lot of time in the private sector um, and, 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 and I, for 14 years uh, in, 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 a, in the, the senior position at, the, at a Fortune 20 company, and the one thing that we had to talk always about was proving the, that, we, th that we deserve access to capital. It's fundamental thinking. Prove that you deserve access to capital. It's a serious, serious point. And you have to be able to prove to other people that you deserve access to it, that you will use it well. That is an art form, and it is a science. And you should have that in your portfolio in addition to your being, first principle, tight. <laughs> Let's do one more. Yeah, and I'll be combining some questions here um, and going to post them to both of you. Since you've seen almost all of it now, uh, looking ahead at the next 10 years, what's going to be the most important public health issues for black Americans, in your opinion? And what do you hope for the state of health in the black community in the United States? What do you think can happen? Now, give me one second. I want to, like, further than the question yeah. to Ashish, because yeah. 
too often we just leave the black issues to the black community. What's our responsibility as yeah. people in public health to respond, support? Let's hear from Dean Jha afterwards. Yes. No, Doc, you want me to go first? You're, you're, on, you're on the point. On the, you're on the clock. <laughs> All right, I'll start by saying, look, um, our responsibilities are deep engagement and partnership uh, to making sure that our community uh, reflects the communities that we serve. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we are going to be judged not by aspirations, not by do we care about equity, I don't even know what that means, it's do we demonstrate both in who we have, what we train people in, and who we work with, um, are we moving the needle on the things that matter in the African American community. Um, that has certainly been my understanding of our personal responsibility as a school. Um, but. This is, this is really about moving the needle through partnerships. I don't feel like uh, a school that doesn't engage with the world uh, is really a public health school. Look, there's a big debate in the academy about uh, how much do you engage in the world versus how much do you focus on the science. Um, I think that's an interesting debate you can have if you're in the economics department, if you're in public health. <laughs> nothing against our economist friends. They're lovely. We love them. Um, <laughs> but if you're in public health, uh, the idea that you do science and then you're done is not our field. And so, yes, you got to get the science right. That's the part about being tight. You have got to get the science right. Right? There is no way John Eisenberg would let you get away with sloppy thinking <laughs> about, uh, about data and evidence and science. But if you stop there, that's not enough. Beautiful. Let me quickly end then with, uh, I wanted him to go first because I wanted him to do that, and I had a sense where he might go. First of all, I think that, um, I'll, I'll come back to the challenge, but, 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 but in terms of what we have to do, um, the reason that the elements that define how we got the closure of that first, tri first primary series COVID vaccine done, how that happened needs to be studied, not only through the prism of African Americans, it is the prism of how to reach people. What I'm getting to is, even though I want to be focused so much on African American issues, I'm really not as much anymore. I'm more focused on how do we reach people. The people in the red states, are I have as much empathy and compassion for them uh, as I do for the black community. That in other words, what I'm getting at is that we've got to now start to not think so much about it in a narrow, we've got the DEI agenda. And we, once we call it DEI, now you, it's, you're in a political world. All of a sudden, all the nut jobs come out, the racists or whatever it is that they want, they'll come after you. What we are talking about is effective interventions to reach people and communities together. That's what we, and there's a science to that. The DEI is not political once it becomes tight in terms of the science of how this works. And so I would just urge a discipline, and, I, and I'm really starting to, to, to and, and, and so as I end up, yes, I just, we just, as, we, as the pandemic wound down, we were able to look up over the barricades and realize that the most important challenge going forward for black America in healthcare is gonna be misinformation, disinformation, and distrust. That's the real issue we're facing. And by the way, hmm, it's also for the red counties and the red state and for the whole damn country. This is the issue. And the question is, is what are we going to do about that? And the solutions for that, for the black community, will be no different or much different than for everybody else. Uh, the same elements. And so without going into the ideology of it, I'll just give you what, just the closing out, what we're doing. So we did create the Coalition for, for, for Trust in Health and Science. Uh, from a standing start uh, a year, uh, almost a year ago, officially, uh, we, uh, I, I had been influenced right before the pandemic by the business roundtable. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jamie Dimon, Bezos, that crowd came out with an announcement. 
maybe return on shareholder value is not the number one thing that the modern CEO ought to be held accountable for. Maybe it is our social responsibility. What? Wow. You said what? No, come on. They said it together. And then I got really pissed off because we didn't say it. The health industry, of all the industries that should have come out, we didn't. They did. Then the pandemic came. I don't know if it was just a PR thing. I don't know. And it's whatever it is. So as soon as the pandemic came down, wound down just enough to look up, and looking at the red states and, 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 and the black community and everybody, we said, you know, we've got to address this. Is it possible, we asked ourselves, to bring together the entire health ecosystem for the first time in history to address an existential threat of this magnitude to every mission statement for every health organization and the ethics of every professional health professional that's ever signed. And could you do it? And so I, we, I was able to connect with people like Bill Novelli and Julie Gerberding and Mary Woolley from Research America and Sudeep Parikh, head of the AAAS, and, um, and somebody I'm probably leaving out, but I should. And so we, I just sort of pulled them all together in a room. No staff, no money, no bureaucracy, no nothing. And with no money, no money, no nothing, 90 organizations are a part of the Coalition for Trust in Health and Science, the AAAS and Academy Health for health service, for the, for the basic science and health service research, AMA, Council of Medical Specialty Societies, and a whole zillion, Bio and Pharma, uh, APHA and NACHO, uh, AHIP, uh, American Telemedicine Association, um, Hastings and Berman Institutes of Ethics, all the way to the right side of the thing, the National uh, pa Patient Health Council and National Consumers League for the patient. 90 of these people are in there, all committed now to working together. I won't have time. And by the way, if, when you see Claire Wardell, would you just, every one of you, when you see Claire walking around, give her a huge hug for Reed Tuxen says, we love you to death because she has been one of the intellectual engines that we have learned from. And so we're going through this whole thing now, and we finally got a grant. And it's going to be really, really hard getting grants in this space, just like you're not going to be able to get grants as easy for DEI, because the politics have now worn us out. And everybody is terrified of having to go down in, in front of the new McCarthy hearings that Jim Jacobs is doing down in the Congress and scaring everybody to death. And so the money is drying up, and people are scared. But, uh, so it's going to be hard. But, Please, please pay attention to this field. Be smart, learn it, and it comes back to where we were at the very beginning, and I just have to say this last word to each of you. Please, 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 take that gentle little flame inside of you, whatever that thing is that caused you to want to do this work, this ephemeral, non-graspable, cotton candy-like something in your heart that says, I need to do this, Nurture it, protect it, husband it every day of your life. Be attentive to what you read. Make sure you're reading the right novels, not the social media. <laughs> Make sure you're reading the people from different, reading Octavio Piaz and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Lucille Clifton and Jampala Lepore and, and read Alice Walker. Read these people every day so that you keep on so that no matter what happens in this election, no matter what happens in the days to come, that you, you don't get cynical, you don't get wore out, and you don't let anybody take away from you your commitment to human survival. That is so important, and you can't take it for granted. It's going to be hard to summarize after that. I, I, I will just say the following. Um, I've um, known you from a distance for a long time. Um, have always felt inspired by the talks I've seen you give. Um, but recognizing at the end of the day, it is about effectiveness. It is about moving the needle on things that matter. And I can't really think of anybody who's done that in more fields, in more ways than you have, Reed, over the last 30 years. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the last few years of really turning this around. Uh, and thank you for your friendship in all of this. Retux in people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.